scripture reading this morning is in Romans 15, verses 4 through 6. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through pers perseverance and to encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, good morning once again. It is wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to share another message from God's Word. And I hope that, um, that as we have gone through the exercises of this worship service that you have been blessed. And it is a, um, it's a great privilege. I always count it a privilege to be with God's people on the Lord's Day. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, thank you for being with us as well. We greatly appreciate your presence and hope that you are built up in the most holy faith from your time with us today. Uh, would you please pray with me as we begin this morning? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the love that you've shown us. We thank you for the precious gift of your Son. We're so thankful, Father, for your Holy Spirit and for your precious Word. And we pray, Father, as we look into your Word, that you would bless us, that you would touch our hearts, that you would open our minds and help us to understand and to grow and to be better able to serve you as we serve each other in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 15, 4 through 6. For the things written before, or whatever things were written before, is a reference here by the Apostle Paul to the Old Testament. It's a reference to the things that were written before the New Testament found its way to ink and paper. And so as he is writing his epistle, he is encouraging the Christians in Rome and down through the years is providing an encouragement to us based upon the Old Testament scriptures. They were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Patience and comfort of the scriptures. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Because how do the scriptures do that? Well, as we follow along through God's word, we're going to notice that God is extremely patient, waiting generations, decades, centuries, before ever pulling the trigger on what his plan was, waiting for people to come around, waiting for people to, to do what it is that he's called for them to do. Consider, if you will, what is recorded for us in Genesis 3.15, as Moses is recording many years after the fact the curses that were pronounced in the garden. And one of the curses was that the seed of the woman, this is a reference to the one who would come from woman, that would be the Messiah, the seed of woman would crush the serpent's head, and yet the serpent would bruise his heel. The bruising of the heel is the crucifixion. The crushing of the head is Jesus overcoming death. That was pronounced in the garden. We're looking at over 4,000 years between the garden and Jesus coming and crushing Satan's head. That's patience. That's patience. We can't wait 30 seconds at a red light. Right? Patience. And so when we see God and his patience fulfilling the things that he's called to fulfill exactly as he said he would fulfill them, that provides us comfort because we know that we are serving and honoring a God who keeps his promises, who is patient, who endures, and but who ultimately would will fulfill those things that he has said he will do. And so we continue. Now may the God of patience and comfort, the very one that provides that for us through the things written before, Grant you to be like-minded toward one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord 
Jesus Christ. With one mind and one mouth. Now we are in the middle of going through some lessons for our theme for the year, Be the Tree. And we've spent a couple of Sundays looking at different aspects of that. Today I want to uh, talk to you for a few moments about what happens when we are not the tree. What happens when we're not the tree? What happens when we don't with one mouth and one mind working together glorify God through our actions and doing the things that he has called for us to do? I would direct your attention to the book of Jonah. Jonah. Once again, the things written before. You're probably saying, Mark, are we going fishing? Or are we going on a three-hour tour and get shipwrecked with Mary Ann and the professor? I mean, what, what are you talking about with Jonah? What does that have to do with us as Christians today? It has everything to do with us. We're going to read down through the end of chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee from to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, And there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lower parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, go to your God. Perhaps your God will consider us, so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, The men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not, uh, excuse me, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as you pleased. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly and said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. Your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The waters surrounded me even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down into the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought me up from the pit. O Lord my God, 
When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto the dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose, went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth cloth and ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and the nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, nor let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it may god bless the reading of his word well we know chapter four jonah gets mad because they repented he gets mad at god but that's not the story i want to talk to you about i want to talk to you about these first three chapters for just a very brief moment i want you to notice that jonah's disobedience led to chaos and confusion When he failed to do what God called him to do, it created a problem, not just for him, but for everybody around him. But yet, when he turned to obedience, God was glorified. This is important for us to recognize. Because we, too, when we don't do what God has asked for us to do, bring chaos and disorder. In our families, in our communities, and ultimately throughout the whole world, it has ripple effects. We should be following what God has called for us to do. I want to talk to you today for just a very brief moment about impacting the world. And this is impacting the world in the negative way, and we want to turn it to a positive when we reach our conclusion this morning. The first thing I want you to notice is that he had a command from God to go. Arise and go. He was told to go. And what did he do? He went in the opposite direction. Do we not sometimes do that very thing? Have we ourselves not been commanded to go? In Mark 28, in Mark, or excuse me, Matthew 28, Mark 16, are we not commanded to go into the world? Isn't the world included with our schools or our neighborhoods? Our families, those close by us, our places of work. The world is not just going to a foreign land. I'm very blessed that on the 1st of February, I get to return to Guyana, Lord willing, for another three weeks of teaching there. I'm very excited about that. But to go from the command of Christ is as you're going through this world, as you're going through your life, as you're going through your daily walk. It's not necessarily a command to go to Nineveh. Now, if the command is to go to Nineveh, then you you absolutely need to go to Nineveh. You don't need to go buy a ticket on a ship and take off in the opposite direction. But that's exactly what he did. He was commanded to go. Secondly, isn't it funny how there's a, a ship going the opposite direction is always so easy to find? When God says to do this over here, isn't it amazing how we can find all these other easier things to do than what God said over here? 
I don't know why that is. You know, when you look at Luke chapter 14, 16 through 24, the Lord himself dealt with excuses. He tells a parable about excuses. Then he said to them, A certain man had a great supper and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to go to those who were invited. Come, for all things are now ready. But they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I, I've bought a piece of land, and I must go, go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I've married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. And the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and yet there's still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those who were invited shall taste my supper. Look at the excuses. Do you think you would buy a yoke of oxen without testing them out first? Do you think you would buy a piece of land without looking at it first? If you, if you would buy land without looking at it first, I've got some great swamp land to sell you. We wouldn't do that, would we? These are excuses. These are not reasons. They began to make excuses for why they couldn't do what they were told to do. Jonah found an easy ship out of town. And we do the very same thing. We, we can find every reason in the world to not be the tree. Lastly, I, want you, I don't know what he paid, but whatever price he paid for that ship, he paid too much. The price was too high to not do what God said. They lost all of their cargo. They had to throw it over. And then ultimately, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Jonah, I want you to get up and I want you to go to Nineveh. And I want you to go preach what I'm going to tell you to preach. So he gets up and he flees the presence of the Lord. He gets on this ship. We've got a storm that's brewing. And he would rather be thrown into the storm, into the water, and drown than to do what God told him to do. The price he paid was too high. It was much too high. We do that ourselves. I want you to look at verse 4 with me for just a moment. Chapter 1. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Folks, the world experiences the results of Christian negligence. The world feels the impact of that. When we are not the tree, when we are not doing the things that God has called for us to do, the world around us also suffers. You don't have to look very far in, in the world today and see the suffering that is caused because Christians have become inwardly focused or they've abandoned what it was they were called to do in the first place and they've become busy doing other things besides the very important work of helping people draw near to God. The world experiences that negligence. But secondly, the world is in desperate need of Christians carrying out the work of the Lord. Desperate need. Look at verses 7 through 11. What was going on during that period of time? These, these men were, were at a loss. They didn't know what was going on. And they're shouting to Jonah to help them. Folks, every time you look on TV and you see there's another shooting, or you see that there's another tragedy of some sort, the world is screaming, help us. 
The world is screaming, we need Jesus in our lives. We need somebody to be the tree so that we can climb up and see over the crowd and see Jesus for who he truly is. It's desperate for those things. So Jonah comes to his senses after three days in the belly of the fish. In verses 2 through 9, he, he's, he's shouting out to God and giving God the glory. And, you know, our own blessings that we experience calls us, motivate us, and lead us to want to share those blessings with others. He was willing to drown instead of go to Nineveh. And God sends a fish to swallow him up, and he stays alive in the belly of the fish. Now, I don't know what Jonah looked like when he came out of that fish for after three days. That might have had something to do with people listening to what he said. I don't know. He must have been a sight. But he's talking about his own worthlessness and how God lifted him out of the pit, how he saved him. And I want you to look at what he says in verse 9. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Why? Salvation is of the Lord. Folks, the, the world cannot be saved if somebody doesn't tell them what they need to do. If they can't point them in the direction of the one who is able to save them. And so the world experiences, just as it did in Jonah's time, experiences the consequences of God's people's neglect. The world experiences that. And we can't stop every bad thing from happening because there's sin in the world, and it was happening during the time of Jesus. It'll happen until he comes back. I understand that. But folks, do you remember... Abraham, and he starts bartering with God for the lives of the people in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lord, surely if there are 50 righteous people, you, you won't destroy them, right? Yeah, for 50 righteous people, I won't. And he keeps going all the way down, 40, 30, 20, gets to 10. He says, for 10, will you spare it? He says, yeah, for the sake of 10. Folks, I want to know who the 10 are in the United States that are going to save this country. And I'm not speaking literally of ten people. I'm talking about who are the ten. Well, if it's not us, then who is it going to be? And so we've got to be the ones. We've got to be the salt. We've got to be the light. And we've got to help the world experience a better reality than the one it's currently in. And we've got to draw people to Christ. We've got to give them the opportunity to know salvation because salvation is of the Lord just as the world experiences the negatives of our neglect the world also experiences the positives of our obedience when Christians are being the influential people they're called to be not standing at funerals with, with ugly signs and doing all the things that that certain people want to do and call themselves Christians, but truly being God's people on earth and loving like God loves and convicting like God convicts and drawing like God draws. We provide blessings to those round about us. You all know about uh, Deputy McCarthy that was shot two weeks ago tonight. And a lot of you know that uh, I enjoy playing racquetball. I, I've enjoyed playing it since I was 11 or 12 years old. My dad taught me how to play. Enjoyed it very much. I've played in tournaments. I've done all kinds of stuff in racquetball. And, and now I'm old and I just like to go sweat. And I play with some guys at the LA Fitness in South Hill. And one of them is a deputy sheriff. And this deputy sheriff that was shot was a friend of his, not just a fellow officer, but a friend. 
He was 34 years old. He was left with a wife and three young children. And he was, he came in the Monday after his buddy had been shot the night before, and he's just kind of sitting there. And, and I said, what's going on? And he tells me what's going on. And I said, well, what was his name? And he tells me it hadn't even been announced on the news at that point who the officer was. And I said, well, he says, why do you want to know? And I said, because I want to pray for his family. And it blew him away. And he goes, yeah, could you pray for his family? I said, could you pray for me too? And for the fellow officers, I said, absolutely, I will. His memorial service was this last week. And I saw my buddy again on Friday at the gym, and, and we were getting ready to play, and uh, I said, how was the service? And he said, it was about as you would expect under those circumstances. It was very sad. I said, how's his family? I've been praying for them. And he said, they're doing about as good as can be expected. He said, but I would appreciate your continued prayers. The blessings that we can pass out, that can bear fruit in the future, might bear fruit right now, it might be a week from now, it might be a year or ten years from now, but we've got to continue to be the tree even when you're playing a silly game of racquetball. That's what we've got to do. And the world can be blessed when we're a blessing. But the world will not be blessed when we're not a blessing. When we pay the price and go down into the ship and go to sleep. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Galatia, the churches of Galatia, towards the conclusion of his letter, writes these words. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that also will he reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Let's not grow weary. Christ is our strength. He never gets tired. There's no reason we should. There's so much good that we can do. And because of the the patience and the comfort of the scriptures, and as we look to his guidance from there, we can together with one mouth and with one mind glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our actions, when you tell people that you are part of the the Puyallup Church of Christ and you speak with one mouth and one mind with your brothers and sisters, you are representing them wherever you find yourself. You're representing them. Be the tree. Help people to see Jesus. Don't neglect your responsibility. Too much is at stake. There's a powerful storm out there. And I hope none of you would rather drown than to do the Lord's work. Because that's what Jonah wanted to do. We are blessed to share this opportunity together. We are blessed. Consider the blessings that God has given you. Share those blessings with those round about you. Make a difference in whatever sphere of influence you have, no matter how small or how large, no matter where it may be. Be an influence to the good. Be a blessing to the world. And in doing so, you will glorify the God and Father of our Lord. We sang the song before the lesson to Christ be loyal and be true. That's what it's all about. We're carrying out his work. 
He's gone to be with the Father. He's coming back. We're carrying out the work that he left for us to do. Let's do that work with diligence. If you're here today and maybe you've decided to, to pay the price and go down and sleep in the bottom of a ship, get out of there. Get out of there now. Come up. Say, I will do what the Lord has said. I will pay my vows to the Lord. I will sacrifice to the Lord because salvation is of the Lord. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. Let us encourage you. If you have any need, whatever. And if you're here today and you've never named the name of Christ, folks, Jesus came to earth from heaven to die for you, to take his sins, make them his own, pay the ultimate price so that you would have access to the Heavenly Father, so that you could be saved eternally. You need to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Turn from those things. Put those things behind you. Turn to the cross of Christ. Confess the precious name of Jesus. And humble yourself calling on the name of the Lord, being immersed in water for the remission of your sins, being raised to walk in a new life, a forgiven life, a life covered by the blood of Christ, a life where now you can be that light in the world that he's called all of us to be. If you have a need today, our song of encouragement is just as I am. Don't wait to get it figured out. Come as you are as together we stand and sing.